and welcome back to Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. I'm your host, Renee Von Metting, and this season I'll be sitting down with none other than Dr. John Kennedy, Medical Director of Therapy Fertility. Hello. Each week we will be chatting all things fertility, trying to conceive, and much, much more. We hope that through this series, through honest conversation and information, we can strip away some of the stigma that sometimes comes hand in hand with infertility and fertility treatment in Ireland. This week, we are going to be answering all those questions that you have been asking about fertility treatment. So there's no silly questions. And John, I'm sure that you have been asked all of these and much, much more before. Very much so. Um, So yeah, let's get right into it. Um, This is a question that has been coming in a lot. Okay. If someone has had treatment at another facility, can they transfer their embryos to therapy? So initially, um, the short answer to that is no, but I'm going to kind of dig into that a little bit more. We've just set up. We're just starting. We've got our uh, we've got our inspection all is going well on that front. It looks like we've got a really world class laboratory and great services, but we haven't started providing care through our laboratory yet. So we want to build our own infrastructures as well as that. And bringing other embryos in is a complication at a start in a lab that's just starting up, which I think would add risk. That's one reason. There's loads of others. One of the more key reasons is that there's about at least five or six different companies that manufacture kits and media to freeze embryos. And if you freeze an embryo using kit one you should really thought using kit one now we have our own kit that we bought and it's tested and it's credited and c marked and all these other good things but if you've had your embryos frozen using another kit which is really quite likely they're all much of a muchness then we would have to get that kit in and build new processes and they might be processes the lab would know but not be as directly familiar with on a day-to-day basis and i think that would add risk to the thawing of those embryos as well thirdly you're adding time and cost to your process. Everybody who's had embryos made has gone to an awful lot of time and effort to make those embryos. Huge amounts of money, huge amounts of effort have generally generally passed. The process of preparing a womb for an embryo transfer is generally quite straightforward. It's generally much more straightforward than the IVF process itself. It's the actual making of the embryos. Exactly. For for us, is the hard part, you know? Uh, And then you're, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still huge emotional, psychological loads associated with frozen embryo transfers, but the physical structures have, have been done. And you look at the reasons why people are moving embryos from one plane to the other. Sometimes it's because they're it's a positive step. I want to move and follow John or what have you. Sometimes it's a negative step. I'm not happy with the with the arrangement I have there. But in most cases, I would urge you, I would urge people to have embryos. Use them. Mm. Get on. Get your head down. Do the transfers. It's your fastest, most efficient way to having having a family. It's certainly the most cost effective way. And if that doesn't work out, absolutely come talk to me. Come talk to us. We'll we'll do another cycle if it's if it's a realistic and reasonable thing to do. We'll generate more embryos. It'll be more affordable. I'd like to think it'll be better. It'll you know that that's fantastic. But you've gone to an awful lot of time and effort to make those embryos. The best thing you can do is just head down and get through and use them. If you don't use them, they tend to eat away at you a little bit. Mm. You tend to remember that they're there and it doesn't give you any kind of closure on 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 the journey you they 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 roll around in your brain and you tend to ascribe too much importance to them you need to realize their potential one way or the other yeah so the answer is no for the moment but down the road potentially 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 yes but i'm i'm much more comfortable i'm a control freak in this regard having complete control over a situation if you've made embryos somewhere else i have less control over that situation i can't speak to them you don't know what the quality is Uh, that and all i mean it's it's labeled and it's graded and all the rest of these things but it didn't come through our system yeah which is the one i really like (laughs) (laughs) okay so speaking of transfers and embryos how many embryos would a person be allowed to transfer at therapy? So the answer there is one or two. We're only going to be going with blastocysts, day five or day six embryos. So we'll never transfer more than two. Uh, you'll just be told no. Um, I'll give you reasons if people are insistent on having reasons. But the end of the conversation is going to be exactly the same. In general, we recommend transferring embryos one at a time. It's better. It's faster. Uh, well, not necessarily faster, but it's, it's, it's easier. 
it's lower risk because you reduce massively your risk of twin pregnancies or triplets or quads or high order multiples. If you put one embryo in, there's a 1% chance that it can split. If you put two, two embryos in, you've got that 1% chance on each one that they could split. In the past, when we froze embryos with slower freezing techniques, there was a 30% loss rate with those embryos. And that put us under enormous pressure to get the embryos back in fresh because you were, if you froze them, you were taking a 30% hit straight away on success rates. With newer freezing techniques, that loss rate is less than 5%, 1% to 2% really. And so it's very safe and reasonable to freeze embryos and to do frozen embryo transfers. So there's less of a rush on us. And if it's affordable and available, you should just be doing single embryo transfers all the way. All that being said, if you're a little bit older and you've had a few failed transfers, it is reasonable to consider and contemplating two embryo, putting two embryos back at the time, provided you are accepting of the risks of twins. Higher risk of pregnancy induced hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes, higher risk of premature labor, higher risk of low birth weight infants who have to go to a neonatal intensive care unit. All of these things much more likely to happen with a twin pregnancy. Most twin, twin pregnancies do fine. I'm, I'm not trying to scaremonger. But there is additional risk. If you are younger or you have other medical conditions, like you've had damage to the womb or an odd-shaped womb or treatments to your cervix or other medical conditions, I may become more adamant and say, listen, we just can't put two back in. A twin pregnancy too is too high risk, yeah. too dangerous. And I think that's a really important word, dangerous. If we're doing something that's dangerous, we really should stop and mm. take a step back. So, And do you find that people often still want to do the two? Sure. Because... I am that person. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. And, and and you weren't going to be told. You've had, since that time, I'll, I'll throw this back on you, you've had an awful lot more education. What would you tell people now? Um, so I suppose with, with my perspective, we always had to travel abroad. And uh -huh. this is one of the things that we're talking about a lot at therapy yep. is people being forced to travel for treatment. Uh -huh. um, so we were for, forced to travel for treatment. So the stakes, I suppose, were a bit higher for us because it was like we need to get pregnant this cycle because we don't have the time and the money to keep coming back and forward with the flights and the accommodation. So we very much were going into our cycles of like, we just need to get pregnant now. And even though we, we were told, you know, it's not necessarily going to increase your chances, we just had it in our heads. Well, surely if, if we're... It'll get you if, there faster. Yeah. Each of the embryos is yeah. potential. But that's crappy medicine, right? <laughs> I mean, by any definition, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying the reasons you're putting forward aren't valid. Of course they're yeah. valid. I mean, we have to live in the real world and there's time and expenses and an impact on people's lives. But you're still applying bad medicine because of that. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's unacceptable. I'm not saying it's unreasonable. I get the logic. I just love to steer away from it. Yeah. I'd, I mean, what you really want is a cooperative partnership with the people that you're treating, yeah. uh, where, where you're all on the same page. If somebody says to me, I want you to put five embryos back in, and I spend a bit of time and effort explain to them why that's a terrible, terrible idea, why it doesn't increase their chance of success, why it's incredibly risky. If at the end of that conversation they go, yeah, okay, I still want five embryos put back in, either I'm terrible at explaining things, mm -hmm. it's possible, or they're just mad. There, yeah. There's a disconnect there. You know, and and really where you, where you have that, what you have is just an utter failure to communicate properly. Yeah. And that's at the cornerstone of, of bad practices. Yeah. So where I become insistent, if it's a medical thing, I go, listen, I got to draw a line here. But I generally try to do it in the context of saying, I have your best interests at heart. I promise you, I've got no skin in this game. You know, yeah. it's not like I'm, I'm being commercially incentivized to hold these embers. The faster we use them, the better off you are, the better off we are. You yeah. know, make it a wall or a door. So I, I'm not pushing it for any other reason other than I think it's the best thing for you. I'm not pretending to have a full and free understanding of everything going on in your life. Yeah. I'm just bringing the medicine into play. What age were you when you had... When those so I suppose I was 28 mm -hmm. for the first two transfers. Yeah. And then I was 30 for another transfer that was unsuccessful. And then I was, for our second daughter, I was 31. So. Yeah. In... But, but I was used, with the caveat that I was using 30 six-year-old eggs and then 38-year-old eggs we are. because so, I was using my wife's so that's, eggs. So, you're yeah, using, yeah. so that's much more important that, yeah. that, uh, that, that your wife's age at... 
egg collection. Sorry, egg, yeah. egg collection. So legislatively, we'll take we'll park your age because it's irrelevant, irrelevant. kind of in this situation. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're under 34, most countries which have legislation, the legislation would say you can only put one embryo back in. And in some ways, that's helpful for a fertility practitioner because it just removes the conversation. I can just hide behind the legislation and go, oh, sorry, I can't yeah, do it. I, I can't do it, I can't do it, oh, it would be illegal. Um, in, but I. But we don't have that. Like, we don't have that. And we may introduce it. And there, there's talk about bringing something mm-hmm. like that in if they're. And uh, I think the problem is that they're going to couch in terms of saying, rather than putting an age in, we're saying, if these are high quality embryos, you can only put them back one at a time. But without any real definition or understanding of what, what are high what quality. What is that? <laughs> what, is, what exactly is a high quality embryo? Um, and I think that's where things could get really, really sticky. It's, it's difficult. Certainly in your scenario, your your wife being 36 or 38 would allow you to transfer two at a time. Aside from the travel and the expense there, if you park that, it's just unnecessary. Yeah. It's just adding risk rather than subtracting risk. And you dodged all those bullets and everything worked out fine. But there's risk there. Yeah. I mean, you. what I like to sometimes say to patients, is, we're, we're in the city centre now. You can run out on the street lashing rain you can close your eyes and you can sprint back and forth across the road 20 times chances are you won't die chances are there'll be no cars or they'll stop okay and chances are you'll be able to do that and at the end of that if you're completely blinkered in your in your logic you'll go running across the road with your eyes closed is a perfectly safe and reasonable (laughs) thing to do now and that's kind of true because you probably won't die there's loads of other checks and balances in place and care and attention and things like that But if you do get hit by a car, nobody is going to be surprised. You are running across the road with your eyes closed. (laughs) Putting two embryos back in is a little bit like that. You are adding a lot of extra risk to yourself and you'll probably get away with it. But because you've probably gotten away with it doesn't mean it was safe. Yeah. And I will say that anyone who I've spoken to has gone through the transfer process and has had either twin or triplet, because I know a few of those, mm-hmm. um, has begged me not to put two back in. Yeah. 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 So that's what I'll say. Yeah. I mean, and uh, there was that story that emerged recently, the triplets down in Cork, and mm-hmm. they were, that was an IVF pregnancy. Yeah. I read in the paper. I don't know the, don't know the couple at all. And one of them, through just m- misadventure, has catastrophic injuries, mm-hmm. I believe. Um, and... Again, it's just you put yourself in that bracket with additional risks and then statistically bad things are more likely to happen. And we just love to be safe. And we've got the technology that allows us to be safe. So let's be safe. I'm all for that. Um, Okay, next question. Where does donor sperm come from? And where does our donor sperm come from? So donor sperm can really come from anywhere, I suppose. Um, But most donor sperm that's used in Ireland comes from Denmark. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is there a reason for that? They have, not really. I mean, other than they have a really good setup for recruiting, testing, and maintaining a donor database. Donor donor base. And anybody can do that if they have the will and they want Mm -hmm. to do it and they think there's, there's a market for it, then anybody can do it. We don't, if we don't necessarily want to use donor sperm, from Ireland for our Irish patients. Cause, and why is that? Because Ireland's tiny. <laughs> You'd Ireland's, end up using like a donor that you're your related second, to? You're going to use your second cousin. <laughs> you, know, you know you are. I mean, it's, it's especially if you're living in the greater Dublin area. I mean, without being facile, the chances of contact me rise to 100% within a month. Um, I remember when my, <laughs> my parents did Ancestry.com and my... They're both from the west of Ireland. It's very worrying. I shouldn't tell the story at all. (laughs) And my aunt, my mother's sister did as well. And my parents were more closely genetically related than my mother and her sister. What? Just, I mean, it's some fugazi oh in the goodness. in the thing. I mean, like they are these obviously aren't related. It's not. Uh, so it's, that's it's not what happened. Thing. But it's it's we're a shallow <laughs> gene pool. Let's if we are going to bring donor sperm into the country, well, let's let's deepen the gene pool a little bit. So where our donor sperm comes from is European Sperm Bank. Uh, it's a Danish sperm bank. Um, they are one of the newer mm-hmm. uh, entrants into the into the space. I think. And they've been just a pleasure to deal with, Mm. I'm happy to say. 
the big thing that they do that we like is they have this thing called pregnancy slots so when you go to buy donor sperm from them you book a pregnancy slot so there's a bit of an extra outlay of cash at the start of that i think it's something like 500 yeah, euro 500, yeah. you pay 500 euro and you get now if you give that pregnancy slot up you get your 500 euro back so, so you that's only refundable. pay that if you you are if get pregnant through that donor and, exactly yeah. and, and hold the pregnancy and have, uh, have a live birth what that pregnancy slot guarantees you is that european sperm bank will not sell that donor sperm to more than three people in ireland okay now that's a very low number that's really really restrictive that's not three i'm not saying necessarily three families will come from this it's just they won't sell to more than three people and that gives you a powerful reassurance that there won't be any consanguinity issues down the line that that your child's conceived with their own sperm is substantially statistically less likely to have a try to have a relationship or a family with yeah and that there's not going to be like 50 families using the same exactly. donor no those risks are very low because this is all identifiable sperm and yeah. the child should find out who the donor is when they're 18 as should and they should be able to find their diblings their donor siblings as well and all that kind of other good stuff so i think that risk of consanguinity is very very low but it is a nice little bit of reassurance that you're not that it's not on them because in ireland there is no legislation governing this in the uk there is in other countries so, so the onus is kind of on the clinics to exactly yeah. but uh, so the onus on the clinics and most of the clinics do but they don't communicate with each other well enough or mm. coherently enough to for that to be a robust system and where they want they're allowed to make exceptions you know because there's no there's no oversight so that we well we want legislation in this space we want a national register we want all this these are things that have been built there is a national register coming in now but it's not until the assisted health reproductive legislation comes in mm. it's not that registra- registry is just there for information it's not there to regulate for control yeah. and regulate yeah. so we're we're regu- we're self-regulating this in a very very strict sense and we know that that sperm bank isn't going to sell to any other clinic in ireland once that donor once that that pregnancy slot is locked in yeah um so some people would ask why is the donor's sperm slightly cheaper when they come to us and i think the reason for that is because we're not making anything from it. You're buying directly from the Yes. Bank. So yeah? so what what we've done, and I think this is this is really important. I've worked in other models where the fertility clinic has taken responsibility for to a greater or lesser extent the selection of the donor sperm and maybe you fill out a short list of donors that you're interested in and then we'll pick one of them. I didn't like that system. I think I haven't fortunately had to do it. Um but I think Picking donor sperm is an important, strange, surreal, difficult process. Um, And the more ownership we give the people who are selecting this, I think the better off they are. So what you do for our process is you, through our website, you click into European Sperm Bank's website and it takes you to the sub bit of European Sperm Bank's website where you're going to get access to suitable donors that's they've signed the relative legislative documents for ireland they've been screened to an appropriate standard the motility on sperm is of a high enough quality for us and then you will see the list of available donors for you and then you pick the donor and then european sperm bank and therapy fertility will coordinate logistics and shipping and all the rest and we'll look after that and there's no extra charge for that you just pay what you pay on yeah. on, uh, on 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 the site and then we take the sperm in. But it gives you ownership of your sperm. We're just minding it for you. That's a nice way of looking at it. Um, another donor question. Can people use known donors? So someone wanted to come to the clinic with a, a friend who wanted to be their donor and they wanted the donor in the child's life, etc. Because a yeah. lot of people want to do this. Is that a service that we can provide known at the moment? Known sperm donation is not a service we are providing at the moment. Um I think it's a service I would like to provide in the future. Mm. Um, but we were just setting up. We wanted to focus on the six or seven key processes mm-hmm. that we were doing. We didn't want to complicate the thing, complicate the waters. But I think it's something that we need to keep an eye on for the future. It was funny when we 
had our inspection the other week. Um, we're all sitting around the room. There's me and there's the quality manager and there's the inspectors. And, and they're saying, are you planning anything else? And everybody else is going, no, no, no. <laughs> and you're like, like uh, yeah, I am. Actually, I'm thinking, I'm just, John, would you and shut like, John, up? Stop now talking. is not the time. We are, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, a really big thing. But it, it, is, it is in my head. And I think it is something just like reciprocal IVF uh, was and, and the, where traditionally we've said, oh, there's no demand for that, so we won't do that. When I think they're actually oh, there is huge demand for, for uh, known donors. A doy, yeah. yeah. a doy. Of course, there of course is, there and is. people should have that choice. It's, it's the kind of thing where you'd love to have nice, strong legislation, which we don't have at the moment. So, to flip it, we for egg don for known egg donation. So you've got a couple, and for whatever reason, she's not produce a heterosexual couple, and she's not producing eggs. Her sister is younger, has lots of eggs. You can donate the eggs, and so we're not doing this either. But anyway, just by the by, get the eggs from her, get sperm from the partner, generate embryos, put the embryos back in, and back in the, 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 the female. And she has a baby. Now, it's very easy to put her name on the birth cert, because she has, she delivers just, the baby. And just because the way our legislation is and set because up, because we're set up, anyone who her, gives birth, is, her tuition yeah. defines yeah. motherhood, uh, legislatively speaking. So, but you don't have that same luxury if it's donor flipped, sperm. If yeah. it's donor sperm, yeah. the brother of the the guy who's who, who's not producing sperm becomes legally the father. Yeah. And you'd love to see something in law protect you there before the clinics yeah. start doing and it. And I think that is coming down down the line. So And I think once once they do that, the the floodgates open. But I don't want to be in a situation where I'm kind of getting dragged into legal wrangles ten years down the line. Genuinely I don't want the headache. Yeah. You know? Um so I would love if the legislation caught up to science and medicine. And the reality of families today. Exactly. Um, another question on donors and birth certs, and this is something that a lot of yep. people are asking because, you know, people are unsure about the recent change in legislation for same-sex uh, female couples who come to therapy for fertility treatment. Uh, will they both be on the birth certificate and how will that look? Yes. And perhaps that's a question I mean, for me. That's a question for you. This is funny. She's not saying this, but uh, the other day she sent me an email for, for this out there and it was a person asking that question and reciprocal IVF. Can we both go on? Uh, one of the one of our uh, patient coordinators was asked and I just gave this very quick reply. Like, yeah, they'll both go on the birth certificate. They'll sign consent. I just fired that back. And then Renee put this excellent, beautifully worded <laughs> answer which discussed changes in legislation. I went, yeah. I mean, why am I bothered um, so I'm talking to somebody who has a much better understanding of it. My Cliff Notes version, before you get into a prettier version, the law changed. It was enacted in May 2020. Provided you sign the proper consent forms at the time, you can both go on the birth cert. OK, now you're going on birth cert as partner, not mother. And I, I don't think they're, they're defining those those terms particularly clearly. But it's uh, you. You can both go on it now. There's a requirement for you to be both to be registered on this national register, and your details to go in there whenever you do, uh, whenever you do treatment, regardless of whether it's successful or not, and whenever you do use treatment using donor sperm. So that all has to be done. But your names can go on the birth cert. It's a, it's it's become a done deal. And that's an excellent answer. It's correct. Well, you know, I'm just copying what I saw in an email last week from somebody I can't remember. Who. Someone. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, um, both both parents will go on the birth cert. Um, the person who gives birth will be registered as the mother, mm -hmm. though they do have the option of being um, named as parent one if they don't wish to be oh, called mother. Okay. Um, the second parent, who is the non-birth parent, not necessarily the non-biological parent in the case of reciprocal IVF, yes. but the second parent, who is the non-birth parent, does not have the option to be put down as mother too. Um, and the reason for this is because it's a co constitutional thing. It, you know, under our constitution, a mother is a person who gives birth and there can only be one person who gives birth. So... I don't see that changing until we perhaps have, you know. Well, I mean, it's a, it becomes a pronoun issue almost, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. Uh, so the second uh, parent can be put down as parent too. Okay. And that's in cases of IUI, IVF, ICSI, um, reciprocal IVF, no matter what path you take, so long as you go through an Irish clinic and, as John said, use all the, you know, proper consents, everything. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So what are your thoughts on... 
um, infusion therapy and, you know, PRP and that, that sort of thing. What are your thoughts on that? And is it something that we provide? It's not something we provide. So what we're going to provide, I'm, I'm very hesitant to use the word basic. Mm. Okay. And I think it's much more appropriate to use the word evidence-based. So modern medicine is struggling with evidence-based medicine at the moment. And I think what we've seen in the last few years is a rise in counter science culture almost where you use science to battle science. And the scientific process is just about getting data, reviewing the data, reviewing it again and again and again. And the more data you get, the more correct the conclusions you will draw from this data is. So we've got pretty strong data on a lot of things we do in fertility, relation to IVF, to ICSI, to egg collections, to embryo transfers, to progesterone timings and things like that. There's a, good, a lot of solid stuff there. Where we don't have a lot of good science is around the woolly areas like PRP, like infusions, like egg quality improvements and things like that. And what tends to happen because people don't have time to wait the 20 years or the 10 years or the seven years for better data to emerge is things come on in a great big rush they fire up they become the new big thing and then literally overnight they drop off i think in fertility one of the finest examples we have of this is a thing called endometrial scratch i'm sure you've heard of it yeah maybe you guys even went through it or something like yeah. that i wouldn't be surprised it was become it became for a few years can i just say it sounds awful Yes. Like just even the phrase scratching yes, it's, like the inside it's, it's, of it's a cr- like, it's yeah. a crappy name. And the fact that it was popular despite being a crappy name is very telling. There was another product which also I don't have a huge amount of faith in called Embryo Glue. That's a deadly name, isn't it? <laughs> Doesn't want embryo, who doesn't like, want embryo glue? My God, what's stick wrong? Stick a bit of Pritt stick in there what's and like the embryo you? will just do you, like... <laughs> do you want it to not be glued in? You know, so these, you know, and, and that shouldn't guide our practice. How sexy a name is shouldn't guide our practice <laughs> at all. But what was really interesting about endometrial scratch is it came out. And about a year after it came out, this was maybe 2008, 2009, I could be completely wrong on those dates. There was an article in, I think, one of the British papers, one of the British Sunday papers saying revolutionary new process in fertility treatment increases success rates by 200%. Five years later, there was another article, same paper, exactly the same paper saying clinics charging for add-ons which have no proven benefit in increasing success rates. Both articles were about endometrial scratch. So that tells you everything. And if you look at the early crappy retrospective data on endometrial scratch it looked promising when you looked at the big meta-analysis and the bigger trials no value at all but all the clinics even the ones i was working in, we all we all adopted it and it really should make you very very nervous about knee jerking into new things which brings us to dhea which brings us to prp which brings us to ivig infusions or intralipids or all this there is no good evidence around these so what you have to do is you have to balance out how much is this costing? How much is this costing financially? Is there any risk with it? So giving an infusion of immunoglobulin, what's the risk of that? Well, it's a blood product. And you don't have to go that far back in Ireland's history to find a history of people who got blood products who ran into problems because of it. I'm speaking, of course, of, of hepatitis. So you have to be very, very cautious about these things. You can get reactions to them. To say nothing, of you're just adding cost and time and worry and hassle. Mm. And it very much falls into the won't do any harm, might do some good category, and we're still, we'll be safe with it, and the risks are low. And also, tragically, the higher the cost, the more likely the person is to believe that it's effective. Yeah. And that's so I think we need to be very metric. The problem is if you offer these things, if you offer these services, all you can be certain of is they will be overused. Okay, I'm not saying these things are of no benefit. What I am saying is our ability to correctly define and diagnose who they are of benefit to is incredibly limited. We aren't good at that. So what we tend to do is we overtreat. So you're putting a whole lot of people through a whole lot of unnecessary stuff for potentially maybe caveated asterisks, tiny, tiny improvements. And I don't think that's right. And I don't think that's fair. And certainly in terms of now being in a center where we don't offer these things at all it's a weight off my mind because no we're just not doing it i'm not if if 
if you're wedded to this and you think it's of benefit of health, who knows, maybe it is, off you go to somewhere that does it and more power to you. I am looking to cater not to the tiny minority of people who need this stuff or would potentially get benefit from this stuff. I'm looking to looking to efficiently and effectively manage the people for whom it will never be of any benefit and get them across the line as quickly as possible. You can't be all things to all people. Mm. And by offering all things to all people, you over-treat and over-expense and over-hassle and over-compromise a bunch of, a bunch, a, a larger cohort of people. And I suppose there's a lot of people who'd be very wedded to this idea of that, you know, this infusion worked for me. And I suppose that comes back to your earlier point of, it, you know, you could do identical protocols with you know for three cycles and get completely different results look there's no point in ever having having an, an argument or a conversation with somebody who goes well i did a transfer and it didn't work or i did three transfers and they didn't work and then i did thing x doesn't matter what thing x is yeah thing x could, could be anything be, it could be taking extra, an extra supplement it could be could be yeah. prayer i mean thing <laughs> x and then i did a cycle and i had a baby yeah, because you'll be convinced that the thing you did differently Forever is... Forever well, more, yeah. and you will tell everybody about Thing X, and Thing X will be the greatest thing since bread came sliced. It's going to be... Now, that's not science. Yeah. That's just odds and statistics and, and, and things of that ilk. So you need to be very careful. But there's no point in hammering away at somebody because they're telling you that. And if you're going to do another cycle with them, good luck getting them not to use Thing X. Yeah. So what you're eventually going to wind up saying is, look... Ultimately, I don't care what works. I just want to get you across the line. I just want to get you success. So yeah, we'll fold it in there. You know, why not? It worked It worked before. We want to replicate because we appreciate that our understanding of these things is incomplete. But as a clinician, let's not lose sight of science. Let's not yeah. lose sight of evidence. Let's not, let's not just run down the street and then start selling thing X to yeah. every Tom, Dick and Harry on the road. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is the best advice that you would give to someone who is about to embark on an IVF cycle or any sort of treatment in order to maximize their chances? So are there like simple free things that people can do to kind of maximize their chances? So look, um, wait, that's the one thing that, that immediately springs into my mind. What can I do? High BMI is associated with lower success rates mm -hmm. and higher complication rates in cycle and in pregnancy. So if your BMI is high, Get that down. Work like a dog on that. And that's free. That is yeah. something you can do. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm <laughs> not at all. But it's definitely not costly. So yeah. you can do that. And that's something you should definitely do. If your BMI is optimal. So it's an odd question because that question is only ever asked, by and large, by people who are already pretty optimized. Mm -hmm. What supplements should I take is asked by people who are already on supplements. <laughs> you know, they're in that space. So... Be healthy. Make smart choices. Don't binge drink. Stop smoking. Um, if you're getting no exercise, start getting some exercise. If you're getting some exercise, maintain that exercise. Don't suddenly stop. What I would suggest, the best advice you can take is if you are making sensible, good choices. And let's be honest, everybody knows what a sensible, good choice is at this point then keep doing that. That's the best thing you can do. The other bits of advice I would give would be don't believe that your mood will affect the outcome. Being positive or negative mentally will not impact the quality of your eggs, the quality of your embryos, or the chances of, of success. So it's okay if you feel good and it's okay if you feel bad. It's certainly easier to go through a cycle if you're feeling optimistic, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to work if you're feeling pessimistic. And when people say, oh, I just knew it wasn't going to work, or I just knew it was going to work, you just go, oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't, to the point in having a row. But I know, or I, yeah, I do know that how they felt didn't have an impact on it. But of course, people will tell you differently. They go, no, 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 my positive mental attitude. I've seen. And look, people go through the things they need to, but I'm interested in the impact of the medication on the ovaries, the production of the eggs and the careful management of those eggs. So make smart choices. If you're not making smart choices before the cycle, start making smart choices. And that's mainly around diet, lifestyle and exercise. In terms of supplements, take your folic acid, take your vitamin D. That's all you really need to be doing. If you've got a healthy diet, you are getting the other supplements you need. You are. You don't need to pour loads more supplements 
supplements into you, it's not going to add to your success rate. Um, and and try in as much as possible to just live a normal life and have this impact on you as little as possible. It's going to have a major impact on you. It can't not, but try to make sure you have some ownership. And that it doesn't kind of overtake absolutely, absolutely everything. I would also suggest, I often say this to people, if you've got some project or promotional opportunity or big time-dependent project and work, maybe don't twin that with an IVF cycle because the IVF cycle will win. Yeah. Um, and you will compromise the other thing. Yeah. So, so while it is good to kind of keep ticking along, keep busy, be, perhaps be, not be, be making, sensible. You know yeah. you're about to go into one of the biggest, most important things you'll ever do. Maybe don't make any big career moves at the exact same time. Exactly. <laughs> yes. um, so, yeah, we touched on that a bit um, about supplements. You know, are there any aside from folic so, acid, I mean, vitamin D that you'd be... So, I mean, like things like high DNA fragmentation, maybe as amenable to antioxidants. There's a lot of, lot of buzz these days about antioxidants and telomeres and all live forever if we just take enough antioxidants and prevent our DNA from degrading. Um, the evidence, not strong. Mm. Uh, the evidence of improvement in egg quality, not strong. The cost of these supplements can be very high. Won't do any harm, might do some good. That's the justification. But it will do harm. Uh, if you're not careful, within a couple of months, you'll have a press full of a shelf full of tablets. You're taking 20 tablets a day. You're spending a couple of hundred euro a month mm. on, on these supplements. And you're doing it because you're terrified of stopping the supplements. And you, it's very easy to add and it's impossible to subtract. So before you know it, you've got into this ridiculous situation. For a lot of women going through fertility treatment, sub compliance is not an issue. Um, they, take, they keep taking the supplements even when it's got completely ridiculous in terms of quantity. For guys, they are generally have the supplements given to them and they are told to take these supplements. And once it exceeds like two tablets a day, compliance tends to drop. And so it's like having an unwell dog. You have to force feed the supplements to it practically or watch them take them. I'm and sure men would love to be compared to an unwell dog. I'm putting, I'm putting my hand up in this regard. Did you? Uh, just, I mean, you didn't hand it to me. It's co-responsibility. I mean, it's so I can be so lazy about this. And I know I'm not alone in that. I'm Look, I'm generalizing, of course. But... It is a source of friction in couples that I want him to take this and he won't. Yeah. Or he keeps forgetting or all the yeah. rest. And will you tell him he has to and go, oh, it's a supplement. He probably doesn't really need to. I mean, he needs to stop smoking, lose weight, what, what have you, and all those things. He needs to share the journey. But I am not nearly as wedded to supplements as I should be. The problem is in this space, the supplement space, the wellness space, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. There really is an awful lot of really, really good stuff. But it's very difficult to separate out the crappy noise from the good stuff. And it all looks the same. It's all painted the same color. If you're just, again, taking it back to first principles, taking it back to science, taking it back to evidence, you're kind of going folic acid, absolutely. Vitamin D, probably. Okay. That's as far as you go. Awesome. How long would you suggest someone waiting um, to try again, whether that be a frozen embryo transfer or a fresh cycle if pregnancy didn't happen, like physically speaking? So physically, you're fine whenever, assuming no other uh, no other considerations in terms of medical conditions or, or things like that. So what you have to do is you have to balance out the, the head and the heart. That's yeah. That's what's key in this. There is a trauma associated with negative cycles, mm -hmm. be it a miscarriage or a failed cycle. There's a trauma associated with that. There's anger, there's guilt, there's shame, there's rage, unbridled rage, there's disappointment. Um, you feel like you've let your partner down. There's a lot of really negative internal stuff that goes on that has to be worked through. Now, one really clever way of not having to work through that is dive straight back into another transfer. Okay. And then you don't have to deal with any of that stuff because you're just doing Put another it in transfer. A box. Put it in a box. Now, the upside of that is if the next transfer works, then you don't have to deal with all that. You never that go back to that box. No, you're like, well, it worked second time, so. That box is gone. So you were just in a process and that. Now, if it doesn't work the second time, that box, it's like a probation thing and you've, mm. you've skipped out of town. You know, it's... It's worse. It's worse. So there's a bigger bill to be paid mm. at the end of that. I... I try to balance between being very respectful of the emotional journey that 
that fertility treatment brings and the slightly more pragmatic approach that says the faster and sooner you get through this and get the hell out of the fertility clinic, the better off you are. The less time you spend in your life engaged with fertility services, the better off your life is. Mm. Now, for some people, that's a couple of months. For some people, it's a couple of years. It, it's different for everybody, depending on circumstances and dumb luck a lot of the time. But I like to go faster rather than slower. And if you start allowing three or four month gaps between transfers and cycles and things like that, very quickly you can realize, oh, I've put my life on hold for a significant length of time mm. here. Um, where you can get away with it, get back in sooner rather than later would be my general advice. But you really have to be very respectful of somebody who's just not coping, yeah. who's just, it's just hurting them too much. And they need time. They need time to heal. They yeah. need time to recharge their batteries. They just need time. Mm. So it's walking that tightrope. So it can really vary from person to person and couple it, it, to couple. It, and it, it can, and the pragmatist in me wants sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, does the quality of an embryo diminish with years that go on? So if someone freeze, freezes an embryo and the egg was 30 and then they don't use it till they're 40, not that that would happen uh, frequently, yeah. but... A, a, a bitch, yeah. I mean, not nearly as much as it would degrade if it was still an egg. Okay. In the person's body. Okay. But there's cosmic radiation, things get, so your cells get getting battered with cosmic radiation all the time and it's knocking out bits of DNA, but the body repairs that DNA. A frozen thing can't do that. So if it gets hit and it gets damaged, it's not going to repair itself. It's, it's, it's frozen, it's locked in. So there is a degradation, but it seems to be very, very marginal. There have been reports of uh, successful pregnancies coming from embryos that are frozen for 17 years or something wow. like the same. Those are and it, those are yeah. single cases, though. It's not like there's it's a huge a study, pile yeah. of data on embryos frozen for 10 years. In the fullness time, we'll get that. And we might learn more about, I mean, in the next 10, 20 years, we'll learn so much about how IVF babies do through adulthood and are sure. they more likely to get diabetes? Are they more likely to be overweight? Are they more likely to have heart disease and all this? We're going to track these very closely that data is still emerging yeah. louise brand mid 40s you know so yeah. that's the first so it's not like there were a whole pile of them born yeah you know that's it's taken a while to ramp up these these numbers so we might know more in the future <laughs> you'd believe a little bit that most of the change would come from the ivf process or freezing as opposed to the length of time being frozen yeah if there are changes to be seen yeah that was actually a question for my wife <laughs> because right. we have we, how long have our three embryos been frozen for like three yeah. and a half years now i don't think i don't think that's unreasonable. Um, think yeah that's and she's kind of like do we need to use them like soon or can we wait well i mean honestly and it's like i would i would have the science of that situation right down at the bottom mm. of the consideration tree yeah like the consideration tree is that having children as you get older is more difficult. <laughs> um, what? Def Having yeah. kids is difficult? Uh, it, it, it just turns out energy <laughs> levels drop as you get older. Who knew? Um, so, and there's, when you finish, your, when you complete your family and you finish having, I mean, there's a joy as the last child steps out of the landmarks. They don't wear nappies anymore. Your, young, put your youngest is six, right? Uh, yeah. Almost? Yeah. Uh, uh, seven. Going seven next oh, month. Oh, wow. Um, so they can put on their own seatbelt in the car. That's a good day. <laughs> and when you don't have another one coming down the tracks and you go, oh man, I got the seatbelt woes for another two, three years. <laughs> you know, it's it's nice to pass these milestones. And when you've got significant gaps, then you spread them out. But hey, that's me. Maybe everybody else is different. I mean, did your family, you're going to go again? Yeah, like we, we definitely, we, we, we haven't had that moment of like, yeah, that's, that's, that's us done. We yeah. thought we would. We always said we'd have two. Yeah. But then after the second was born, like, I think I was like getting a blood transfusion and I was saying, oh, no, we'll definitely have another one. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Really? Yeah. 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 yeah that's the anemia talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I don't think we're finished, but um, yeah, we'll see what happens. But it, yeah, it was just interesting to kind of think, do like the chances of one of those embryos working diminish with every passing year? I, I, I'm not statistically significantly yeah. enough to... To warrant to kind of like do it now. You don't need to consider it. I so think. we don't need to go now, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, I feel like my comments are being weaponized. I, don't know. <laughs> I know. I'm gonna every day. I'm going home, Audrey. I'm like, well, Dr. Kennedy says this. So, <laughs> okay. Does an IVF pregnancy or uh, you know a pregnancy through fertility treatment behave differently to a natural conception? Like, do you need to be more careful? So, do you need to take extra supplements or? So um, I don't think you necessarily need to take extra supplements. No, but fertility conceived pregnancies IVF pregnancies are regarded as being high risk pregnancies automatically now that's a bit of a label don't get too excited about it anybody over the age of 35 is that's also, also high risk uh, geriatric I didn't actually. say it I didn't say it I didn't say it because while I appreciate that the lexicon was written by old white dudes I do think we perhaps need to update it um, geriatric it's so rude what were they thinking or was it is, is that a malicious term or is it just not ignorant but just so unaware so yeah. blind to the yeah. impact of language that yeah, yeah we're going to call it geriatric that's going to be fine nobody's going to have a problem with that <laughs> or if they do eh, not there's not going to be that many of them i mean crazy crazy anyway so high risk it's regarded as being a high risk pregnancy so it is managed slightly differently in the sense of you might have an extra scan during the pregnancy just to look at the birth weight we do know that IVF pregnancies, you are slightly more likely to have abnormal placentation. That's where the placenta implants in an area just not where it normally is up at the top of the uterus. It's kind of a little bit lower, maybe covering the cervix, mm -hmm. maybe you could placenta previa or kind of burying itself into the wall of the womb a little bit called placenta accreta. We know that birth weights can be a little bit different, sometimes a little bit higher. We know there's a slightly higher risk of gestational diabetes depending on if it's IVF ICSI, depending on the quality of the embryos, perhaps going into the situation, maybe you're more likely to have a chromosome or a structural problem. You know, that's maybe not necessarily the process of IVF ICSI, more the need for it. Yeah. You know, so you've got to try to balance those those two things out as well. But they are higher risk pregnancies, not massively so. The main thing about an IVF pregnancy, it's long. It's just long. Oh, yeah, because like if people are finding out they're pregnant at like three months along. All right, there. People are finding out they're pregnant at the start of the cycle. That's yeah. when the clock is is actually starting. So it's not even a nine month pregnancy. It's a it's a ten and a half month yeah. pregnancy in some cases, realistically. Yeah. So so they are a hell of a lot longer, and there's a hell of a lot more anxiety, especially in those early stages, because instead of realizing you're pregnant and then having a scan to confirm it a week or two later, you're realizing you're pregnant and you're waiting four or five weeks, and that's a that's a long time. Yeah. That drags out. So they're 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 a lot longer. The other thing that I think people need to be really, really aware of um, is that postnatal depression and baby blues and low mood and all of these things are as likely to happen after an IVF pregnancy as they are after a normal pregnancy. And in some ways, you're much more at risk of it because these are the most wanted pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And we know that bonding happens after a birth, but not necessarily immediately. And there's plenty of stories of I didn't bond with bond with them. I mean, I cared for them, I changed them, I fed them, but it was just, you know, I didn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Now, people can often flip into, oh my lord, I'm not right, I'm not there's something wrong with me, I'm not fit to be a be a mother, I'm not fit to to mind a child, I, I'm lacking that spark, and that can aggravate. Uh, postnatal depression it can aggravate baby blues it can make things worse now if you tip in the but i really wanted this pregnancy i've spent mm -hmm. thousands of euro on it i've spent months of my life i've not gone for the job promotion the extra bit of training or education i stopped all that just had, and now here i am and i've realized there's something wrong with me yeah. just be kind to yourself it comes in time you bond in exactly the same way everything happens as it as it would normally on that statistical curve sometimes quickly sometimes more slowly it'll all work out but don't beat yourself up because you wanted this pregnancy and now you're unhappy at the problems associated with the pregnancy, be it. Because you would probably service. would have had those problems anyways. I know, but absolutely. Know. But the notion that, oh, no, I asked for all of this, so this is all my fault, so I should be yeah. able to weather the storm. I should be a perfect mother because I wanted to be a mother. That's nonsense. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it safe to get the covid vaccination does it affect fertility does it affect pregnancy and is there like data to support so any of those so yeah i mean i'm gonna say make a bunch, bunch of sweeping statements and i don't have data for so i think that's really important that we do that in covid <laughs> times 
Um, to the best of our knowledge, with the caveats, with the asterisks beside it, that we don't have huge amounts of data on this, it would appear that COVID does not have a significant impact on fertility in and of itself, excepting if it makes you ridiculously sick or compromises you as a whole human being in some way on the, at the extreme end. But your standard COVID doesn't appear to. Equally, vaccination does not appear to have an impact on fertility, on egg count, on egg quality, on sperm quality, etc., etc., to the best of our knowledge. Okay? So we are strongly recommending that people get vaccinated as part of the national program as, as uh, in all of this. We treat fertility treatment as we treat early pregnancy. So if you're actively going through fertility treatment for vaccine purposes, we would suggest to you it's like you're in early pregnancy and the, the advice is not to get the vaccine in the first 12 weeks. Not because we think there's a massive risk with it, but because we just don't know and we want to be super safe. Okay, so... If you're contemplating fertility treatment and you're about to have the vaccine, you've got two choices. One is to go for your fertility treatment and defer having the vaccine until you're pregnant or after 12 weeks or your treatment's finished. Or option two is go and get the vaccine, get the repeat dose, wait for two weeks, start your treatment. Option two is obviously the more sensible thing to do. Yeah. Great. Okay. Last question. So we have our complete packages whether it be egg freezing ivf reciprocal ivf whatever and these complete packages are all inclusive but what does all inclusive mean yes. what does it include so I, I what does it include and and very specifically what does it not include and i think there so what we've tried to do we've tried to learn from the lessons of the past in terms of where people get fudged where people get a little bit irate because hang on why is that an adult why is that not included? so Let's say you do IVF, okay? What's not included? Well, for us, your initial nurse consultation is free. If you have tests or, or, or workups, that's not included in the package of IVF because at that point you haven't decided to do IVF, all right? So your blood tests, your womb assessment, your semen analysis, counseling, implications, what have you, that kind of thing, that's not, in the main, that's not included, all right? You then have to come and see a doctor, me or somebody else, and that's not included. Now, we've tried to make all of these things more affordable mm -hmm. than they have been in the past. So we've yeah. tried to reduce the cost of these, but there is a cost associated with that. I think a consult with me is running at €100, Euro, which I think is reasonable. That's fairly good value, I think. I that's would say. I, well, yeah, but I mean, it's not really for me to say, but, uh, but I, I think that's good value. So that's not included. The other thing that's not included, if you decide, right, I want to do... IVF. A legislative requirement is that you have HIV and hepatitis screening. This is a test that needs to be done in advance of the cycle to make sure we can bring samples safely into the lab. Again, that's not included. It's something you have to do, but it's testing. Again, if it's positive, then we won't be able to potentially treat you, and there, there's, there's subtleties to it. So that's not included either. All right? What is included? Your scheduling, the, the blood tests, the hormone testing that we might need to do, the ultrasounds that we might need to do, the egg collection, the growing out the embryos for five or six days to the blastocyst stage, the use of the time lapse incubator, embryoscope is included. If we are freezing all the embryos, or freezing any embryos, that's included in it as well. Your if your transfers, your fresh transfers included in that, your first pregnancy blood test is included, your first pregnancy scan is included. That's all included. What's not included in that are the cost of your medications. Again, that's not we're not charging that money. That's going that's going to the pharmacy company or what have you. And it's not actually that expensive for medication so in Ireland. For people in Ireland who have a who have a DPS card, drug payment scheme card, who can you can if you have a PPSN, you can get a DPS card, and that means you won't pay more than one hundred and twenty. I think something. they actually reduced it. It's one fourteen now. One fourteen, which is very, and okay. that actually that includes if you are a part part of a family and anyone is on medication. Yes, it's so, that whole household. So, so you won't pay more than one hundred and fourteen for yeah, the whole household for that month, and we try yeah. to load us the medications for the month into that into, into that one into so that. they don't have to so do two months sometimes it, yeah. it will fall into a second month depending yeah. on dates and things like that the way it works you can't give medications for a cycle which generally takes about a month mm. you have to give it as part of the calendar we try to be clever where we can about that but again that's 120 something but it's a, not going to the clinic yeah, yeah. no it's not the, the other thing that's not included we are so what we're doing is we're not charging for freezing 
Okay. And is that something that traditionally would be a charge? Yes. Okay. So traditionally what's happened is the freezing of the first year storage is all bulked together. And I think that's just a foolish way of doing things. It's not, it's less transparent. So we're not charging for freezing and that would generally be a 500 euro charge in mm -hmm. most places. What we are doing is charging for storage. And that charge will start from the moment you have something stored with us. But it's not owners. It's 18 euro per month. Yeah. So we're trying to keep those so costs low. So it's cheaper. Again. If, you, if you use the embryo or the eggs of the sperm quickly, then that charge stops. If you don't, then that charge continues. And I think that's a, a good way of maintaining the relationship between you and your frozen eggs, sperm or embryos. And I like that. I think it's a more transparent, more honest thing. Because if you're saying, right, we're going to charge you by the year, well, okay. If you use them within six months and then, you're, then you've, you've still paid for the whole year. You, you've lost six months equally if after, if you haven't paid and you go, well, I'm going to use them now. Maybe that charge gets waived. And I just think it's a, it's a less transparent, it's a less robust system. So we're charging on a per month. And if you have to have a frozen embryo transfer, there's a cost for that because yeah. it's a scheduling event. It's a, it's, there's scheduling, there's medications. There's all the usual palaver that goes on, blood thawing of, of embryos. There's work that goes mm. into that. So there's a charge associated with that. On the website, please go look, anybody. Um, we've tried to be really, really transparent, not only about what's included. We've tried to be transparent about what's not included, where we've we've put lines in about what happens if cycles get cancelled at various stages, how much you yeah. get back. What we really want to do is avoid the conversation. Well, I had no idea it was going to cost X. Yeah. You know, and we've had, we've all of us who've worked in this field have had those conversations too many times. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to change that. We won't hit you up for a bunch of extra add-ons. We just won't offer them to you. Yeah. And people go, oh, well, I want to have embryo glue. I don't believe in embryo glue. I don't think it increases your chances of success. So we don't have it in the glue. Oh, can I have it if I want it to make? No, we're not that, we're not those guys. Fine, listen, yeah. you know. Um, and we, we're setting out our stall very clearly and at the front end so that people, we are managing people's expectations. And what we are, what I believe we are going to do is deliver very effective, very successful care using this model. Yeah. I think this model is going to knock it out of the park, to be quite honest. Yeah. I think all the noise that's associated with, with other add-ons, things like that, doesn't add nearly as much value as it claims to. Yeah. Um, I actually love the fact that some of those testing bloods have been kind of decoupled from the package cost. Because say if you look at someone who may need to go through two cycles of IVF, if they pay for some of those testing bloods within that package, they don't necessarily need those same bloods the second time. But if it's in the package cost, yeah. they've paid for it. So it was very funny. I was talking to to my dad, actually, two weeks ago. I was just breaking down what we're doing. And he's, he's, he's not from a medical background. And I, he, was, I was, he was looking at the prices and he was saying, right, what are the other clinics charging? And I broke it down. And I kind of broke down the explanation of where the difference in cost might be. And his immediate reaction broke my heart a little bit was, Geez, would you not just charge less here and then put some money? I was like, that's exactly what I don't want to do. I want to change the script here. And I want, I want, when I, when we say inclusive packages, really what I'm trying to say is things like blast assist and things like time lapse incubators should be a normal part of every single cycle. We shouldn't be thinking of them as add-ons. We should be thinking of this core standard of care. Baseline. Baseline. So yeah. we should, they should be stripped out of the add-ons mm. place and, and put into that and go, look, it's modern IVF. It should be day five. It should be time lapse and it should be freezing. You know, of course it should. So we're trying to just change how we think and approach about mm. uh, approach this. And then in the fullness of time, what will definitely happen is that something else will come along, a new add-on, something else that... And, I would like to think that I would be open enough to looking at evidence, looking at growth and going, do you know what? That does add value in this cohort of people. Mm. And in a very slow, careful, responsible way, you would put that in, mm. you know, yep. but we've done that with too many things now and it's time to rationalize it all out and, yep. and, and, and simplify things. And that's what Strip we're doing. Strip it back a bit. Yeah. Um, last question to finish on. Um, and I think I've asked you this before, but... When you're looking at a practical cycle of IVF, just the like from start to finish, uh -huh. meeting a person or a couple and then, you know, and end result, what is your actual favorite physical part of the process? Be it actually having that first consultation, an egg collection, some of the testing mm. investigations, transfer day. Transfer day is fun. 
transfer day is always very positive i like that um the easy answer is doing positive pregnancy scans is great that's great i mean that's a that's a that's a really and really when good. would that happen after a, that would a happen blood test after the transfer after the blood test and all this. so I about mean, but four it, weeks that's, after? yeah yeah give or take yeah. after the blood, that's a painfully obvious answer though I kind of, I've always got a kick out of meeting people. I really always loved initial consults. I love finding out about people. I've l always loved that. I love what, you love talking? Yeah, what? No. <laughs> well, I'm trying to, two of these, one of these, two ears, one mouth. Um, and, and those, you're really trying to listen. But I love asking people what they, what they do for a living. I really do. I get a huge kick of finding out what makes people tick and i get more satisfaction from engaging with patients in, in consultation than i do from from most things and good consults and hell even even bad consults where you're when either giving bad ones, news yeah. or you're dealing with with confrontation managing these situations well communicating well with people i get a huge kick out of it god help you if you've got an interesting job because i'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to consultation subvert. might oh. take a bit longer. Oh God, no! I've been very honest with that. I said, "Look, like, we're going to come back to your fertility issues. We're going to spend the next ten minutes talking about <laughs> forget forget the baby making, Talk to you, like to being a cultural <laughs> cultural anthro uh, anthropologist. That's fascinating to me. We're yeah, going to talk yeah. about that for for at least half an hour. Um, you know, it's like, but yeah, 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 we'll come to it. But no, you want to give people time and all that. But I I love engaging with people and. Some people love their jobs, some people don't, some people, you know, but finding out what what people enjoy, what their motivations are, and, and trying to get a read on them, that's probably my favourite part of the job, yeah. Good to know. Okay, well, as always, it's been a pleasure chatting. Likewise. I think we could do a whole other um, episode just on frequently asked questions, questions because there are so many. More than happy to.